Testing, one, two, three. All right, let's make sure this is working. All right, let's make sure this is working. Looks good so far. We will start up just as soon as everybody joins. All right, looks like people are there. So welcome to the third live lecture for the mobile cloud programming class. Uh, today, we're going to do two main things and one minor thing. We're going to first give an overview of SQL Lite. And I will talk about the features that SQL Lite provides. And then we're going to go ahead and look at a, an extended example of applying SQL Lite. And we're going to go back and revise our Hobbit provider example to show how to use SQL Lite to implement the various operations. And uh, I'll walk through that code and, and show you how to use how to implement SQL Lite based content providers. And then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of the features of the weather service provider example, which has a lot in common with the first programming assignment. We'll really go through the weather service provider example in much more detail on Wednesday, but I just want to kind of walk you through the overall architecture of the solution so you get a feeling for how it's done. So without any further ado, uh, first of all, hopefully everybody can hear me, but uh, secondly, let me go ahead and I will share my slides and we'll begin. I can bring those up. All right, hopefully you can see this. And let me go ahead and make that full screen. So what we're going to start talking about today is SQL Lite. And that's basically the database mechanism that Android provides to manage persistent data. And we'll talk about the features that it provides and so on. And then we'll also go ahead and show how to apply SQLite to implement Android content providers. And we'll do this in the context of the Hobbit content provider application. And uh, here's where you can get the code. So you can follow along. I've, I've updated it quite a bit since the version that we went over last week on Friday. So it's got a lot more cool things going on and it uh, illustrates a bunch of different interesting concepts and patterns. We'll talk about those, of course, as we go through it. Let's first start by talking about SQLite. So SQLite is basically a relational database that's been optimized for mobile devices. And basically, you can create tables, which are row and column data structures that can be made persistent or that are persistent, indexes, etc. And these things all are exposed via a so-called schema. And you can learn more about how all this stuff works here, this article. The reason why SQLite was picked for Android is because it's got a relatively small footprint, something on the order of 350 kilobytes. And it sits within a single disk file. You can read more about SQLite in general here at this link. Every Android device comes with SQLite configured by default. Uh, obviously, there are other databases you could use, but you'd have to go ahead and install them. 
you don't have to do complicated setup procedures or administration of the database. It works fairly straightforwardly. You just need to define your SQL statements to create and update the database, and it takes care of the bulk of the other stuff. Uh, if you're familiar at all with the structured query language, the 1992 spec, then SQL Lite supports most of this specification. You can read more about that here. And of course, it provides the so-called ACID properties, which stands for atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. And uh, you'll see what that all means. If you don't already know that, it's a pretty common concept. You'll see what that all means as we start looking at some of the examples that illustrate how it gets used. Typically, when you access an SQLite database, this is going to interact with the Android file system. And uh, you can read more about that here at this link. Because file system access may be slow and or because you can do sophisticated queries and other kinds of operations, the joins and so on with SQLite, you typically want to access the database either concurrently and or asynchronously. And so what that means is that typically when you use the database, you'll be interacting with it via an async task in order to be able to run the processing in a background thread if you're going to do it with a synchronous model, which is the default, is, is the synchronous mode. Uh, there are also several asynchronous ways of getting access to content uh, that's stored in SQLite database and by a content provider using something called an async query handler and a cursor loader. What's cool about all these different mechanisms is that the content provider basically stays the same. It doesn't change, but the means by which you access the content provider are ever so slightly different to be either have a separate thread running or to be doing things in a more asynchronous manner from the application's perspective. And there are a whole bunch of cool patterns that go along with this stuff. We've talked about async tasks already. I will talk about async query handlers and cursor loaders later, probably uh, next week. So let's talk about some of the SQLite related classes that you're likely to run into when you use these things. Uh, so the SQLite database is the base class for using an SQLite database. That's typically what you're going to use to get access to all the operations that you care about. You can read about it more at this link. It provides the various so-called CRUD operations. So you have insert to add things into the database. You have update to modify things that are already there. You have delete, which will remove some or all of the elements of the database. You also have ways of being able to execute SQL statements directly if you want to get sort of raw access to the SQL. That's not a common thing to do, but it does come in handy for a few operations. And then, of course, the other big thing you do with the database, arguably the most common thing that you do is you query it, which is sort of a, a fancy read operation. And there's a couple of different approaches you can use. There's a, a query method, and the query method, uh, as you'll see later, has a bunch of parameters that can be filled in with wildcards. There's a raw query method, which is a little bit lower level. There's also a query builder class, which you can use to build up using the builder pattern. And uh, different techniques give rise to different approaches. I tend to use query a lot, but query builder is also very popular. Whatever works for you is perfectly fine to do for the assignments that we're working on and so on. There's also some other helper classes that get used with SQLite that are also exposed via content providers, probably the most important of which is the content values class. And basically, this is used to define key value tuples, where the key represents the the table column ID and the value represents the content for the table record or records in the in the column. And uh, these, of course, are typically used for inserts and updates of database entries. The recommended way of, of accessing SQLite is to subclass something called the SQLite uh, Open Helper. And that's sort of a convenience class that abstracts and, and encapsulates certain kinds of things, uh, especially things like uh, creating the database and uh, being able to manage versioning and so on. You typically end up calling your class, that subclass from SQLite Open Helper, will go ahead and call up to the super class in, in the uh, uh, SQLite database 
in, in order to be able to specify the database name and the current database version number, I'll show you some examples of that shortly. And then the onCreate method is called if the database doesn't exist yet, and you typically write that cook method to create the table commands. <clears throat> and then there's also this onUpgrade method, which can be used to allow the database schema to evolve over time, which is important if you're changing your application and you don't want to break what's already there. There's a number of helper methods that you can use to open and return the underlying database, uh, the most common of which are getting the database for readable access, which means you can just uh, query it, or for writable access, which allows you to be able to insert, update, and delete. So those are kind of the different modes for accessing elements in the database. So let's talk a bit about how you might actually program SQLite. So to do this, we're going to kind of talk about an example I'll look at in more detail here in a minute. Uh, this is basically the, the Hobbit content provider, which is used to insert, query, update, delete, and display various characters from the classic J.R.R. Tolkien book called The Hobbit. This is the book, not the movie, by the way, for those of you who know the difference between the book and the movie. Uh, so one of the first things that you typically do is you end up uh, opening and and creating the SQLite database. So to do that, we have a Hobbit database helper, whoops, which has a typo. I'll, I'm not gonna go through and fix all this stuff right now. I'll fix it when I put the new version up, but I don't wanna confuse people on the very first slide. That should look like that. I'll go through and, and fix this for the, uh, the rest of these before I put the slides out online. Um, and so what the, Database, Hobbit Database Helper does is it extends SQLite Open Helper and it defines the SQL commands for creating the Hobbit table, which as you can see here has a name and of course an ID, which is the primary key, a column name, which is text, which is um, like the character's name, like Bilbo or Gandalf, and then the, the race, which is also another column, which is text, non null, which would be something like. Uh, a, a hobbit or a door for something like that. Typically, you use the subclass when you create the SQL tables. Here's the constructor. You can see it calls up to the SQL light open helper, and it basically passes in where you want this stored. We're going to put it in the, the cache directory so that Android can clean it up if, uh, if we start running low on space. We have uh, the database name, which you can name, and the database version. These are all things we'll talk about a little bit later. Here's the actual onCreate command. As you can see, this goes ahead and executes the SQL string to go ahead and create the table. And then here's the upgrade method, which goes ahead and drops the table if it already exists, and then creates a new table. So that's basically kind of how you get things up and running. And we'll, we'll show more detailed code here shortly. Then there's also a bunch of methods for inserting things into an SQLite database. So here's the insert method. Uh, this has two important parameters and one kind of weird parameter. The most important parameters, of course, are the table, which is the table to insert the row into, and then the values. And that's, of course, a content values object that indicates the, the key and the, uh, and the values you want put in to a particular row on the table. Here's a simple example that we'll come back and, and look at later. Uh, oh, and also this returns whether or not you successfully inserted something. Uh, this is the insert characters method from the Hobbit provider that works with SQLite. And we'll look at this code in more detail, but here's just the SQL code. Uh, when you want to insert characters, then we go ahead and uh, get the, the writable database, and we use that database to insert into the table the new content values object. And uh, so this will allow us to insert a new object into the table. And if it succeeds, if we get an ID back that's greater than zero, then we go ahead and build a URI that includes that ID along with the URL, and that gets returned as the result from insert character. So it'll give you back the URI pointing to the element that was just inserted into the database. Here's the 
the update method updates a little bit more sophisticated than uh, insert <clears throat> update basically indicates which table you want the row or rows inserted into you also give the content values that you want inserted and then you have a couple of optional parameters which are the where clause and the where args and uh, these basically used are used to limit the way in which the update is applied if you pass in null for these then it'll go ahead and update all the elements in the table with the new values the new content values that's typically not what you want <laughs> uh, that would be over overly uh, broad usually what you want to do is you usually want to specify a particular row or a set of rows and that's what the where clause does and then you can also indicate what values you want to be used if you have any wildcards in the where clause so you can do things like update a specific ID or you can uh, update all rows whose certain column has a particular value or whose groups of columns have particular values. You can control all those kinds of things. Um, here's a simple example from the Hobbit content provider. Uh, we'll come back and talk about what add selection args is later. We won't talk about that right now. That's a little trick I put in there to make things be less leaky as abstractions, which we'll talk about when we look at the code in more depth. But basically what we're doing here is we have to get the database in writable mode, of course, because we're going to update it. We go and find the table, and then we go through and we identify where we want to do the updates based on the selection args, if, if there are any, of course. The delete operation goes ahead and deletes certain things from this designated table. You can either provide nulls for the where clause and where args, in which case the entire table will be deleted, or you can indicate specific row or specific rows that you want to have deleted by giving a where clause and where args, which you can have in various means. Uh, so here's, here's a simple way in which this code gets used. Again, we'll talk about add selection args later, but uh, in this case, we're gonna delete from the table some set of characters, and you can specify which characters you want to delete. You can either delete characters by name, or you can delete characters by their race, or you can delete all the characters. It's up to you uh, how you want to delete things. And I'll show you the examples of where that gets used shortly. There's also, of course, a bunch of query operations. Being able to query the database, there's a raw query, which is pretty straightforward. That In that, you give it the SQL string itself. And you can also give some selection args that fill in the wildcards there. And this returns a, a cursor. We'll talk more about cursors in a second. The more common way of doing things is to use the query uh, method. And there's several different query methods. This is one of the ones that is most popular. This takes a bunch of parameters. Um, so we have the, the table, which of course is where we're going to uh, submit the query to. We have a list of columns, which are often called the projections, which are the columns in the table that you actually care about. If you put a null here, then it'll consider all columns. You have a selection, which is basically the where clause, and you have selection args, where you can indicate wildcards to fill in in the where clause. Then there's a couple of other things, group by and having, which is pretty not as common to use. Uh, you usually just provide nulls. And you can also sort the table to order things in a particular way. If you give a null, it means let the, let the, con let the SQLite database order it however it feels like it. Here's an example of how we use this stuff. We query for characters, like we can look up the characters in the table. Um, and typically, we're going to go ahead and look up for all the different uh, columns. And then you can designate what kind of, of selection you want to do. Do you want to look up for all rows, in which case you pass a null? Do you want to look up specific uh, columns with specific names? Do you want to look up things with a particular ID? and so on and so forth. And so pro by providing the appropriate selection um, string and selection args, you can bound the way in which the ordering gets done when it returns things to you. Now, query returns something called a cursor, which is basically an iterator. So it uses the iterator pattern, and it represents the result of a query. And it basically allows you to walk through the result one row at a time, if, if there were, in fact, any rows that ended up 
satisfying the, the query uh, criteria in the where clause. The reason why we use cursors, of course, is why we always use iterators. We want to abstract away from the details of how the results are returned. So you can buffer the data intelligently without having to return it all in one fell swoop. The cursor mechanism can do this thing in a buffered way. You can use iterator or buffered iterator and so on, so it doesn't have to load as much data into memory. By default, cursors are not synchronized. So that means that if you have multiple threads accessing cursors, you've got to provide locking for the operations on them. There's a method on a cursor called get count that returns the number of elements of the query. It's kind of like a size method on a collection. You can move to the first to start at the beginning of the query, and you can move to next to advance yourself through, just like you would do with um, uh, the next method on an iterator. Is after last checks to see if the end of the result has been reached. And then there's a whole bunch of different get methods that you can use to get various types out of the, the cursor. So you can basically um, grab different uh, column entries of the current row that you're iterating over by using these typed methods like get long and you give an index and it returns that index as a long get string you give it an index it returns that index as a string and so on and so forth which of course suggests that you need to know the types of the fields to use this appropriately there's also a get index or throw method to get the column index for a column name of the table which will either return the index or will throw an exception if it says not anything by that name in there the other thing to remember is that when the cursor when you're done with the cursor you need to close it otherwise it'll leak memory and ideally what i typically end up using in my code is is the java 7 try with resources blocks which implies that you really should be using uh version uh, api version 19 of android Although I think you can use it with earlier versions too. It just gives you a lint warning. I think it'll work. So that's basically uh, how you use the cursors. And then another typical thing you do with SQLite is you end up creating adapters or curse, so-called cursor adapters that basically allow you to display the results of a cursor in some type of list view. And so we'll look at some examples. Here's one of the ones from the, the uh, application that we're going to show here, where you, you basically have a factory method that gets you a simple cursor adapter that can be used to display the results of a cursor. OK. So that is basically, that's basically what we've got here. Let me go ahead and uh, pop back over here and see if there's any questions so far. If there are no questions, then I will continue on and we'll go through the example. And uh, the example is, is pretty cool. We're going to show a bunch of interesting things with the example. So let me, uh, let's see, let's start out doing the example this way. Whoops, wrong thing. Let's try sharing something different. There we go. So here is the new implementation of the Hobbit content provider. If you uh, go to the GitHub account that we have for the mobile cloud MOOC, you'll see where you can download the code. I've updated a bunch of things in there. Uh, one of the cool things you'll see when you start looking at this code is it explains in great detail what the patterns are that the code is implementing. And uh, probably the most important pattern to understand, thanks to Firas from last week, is something called Model View Presenter. So if you Google Model View Presenter and read the Wikipedia, Wikipedia entry for Model View Presenter, you'll see how this works. And this is basically the pattern that we've been using for uh, pretty much all the application examples we've been doing now for, for the last several MOOCs. And what it does is it separates things into three main categories. We have the 
the model, which is the provider, which is where the data comes from. We have the view, which is the activity or activities, which is how we visualize the results and also get input. And then we have the presenter, which is basically the middleman that sits between the view and the model and is responsible for doing the operations to get the model presented appropriately in the view. So that's the pattern that we've been using. So uh, one of the great things about this course is you're not just learning the low level mechanisms of SQL, but more importantly, you're learning patterns for designing uh, applications that are time honored and, and well understood and well recognized in, in the community of software developers for uh, graphically oriented applications. So that's kind of the big picture view. Now, if you want an even more detailed view, then we can do this, which is kind of fun. We can go in here and open up a class diagram, which we'll call bar, for lack of a better term. And then we can go ahead and, and drag in the various activities and other classes. So here's Hobbit activity. And you'll notice that Hobbit activity is a generic activity. And uh, that basically is the, the view representation here. Um, and let's see, let's go ahead and use object aid to kind of shrink this down a little bit. We won't show the stereotype. Uh, we won't show the package name. And we will get rid of all the operations. There we go. So that's nice and concise now. Let's get him out of the way. So that's basically the, the that's the the view part. Here is the model part. So you can see that we can come along and pull this stuff in over here. And uh, let's go ahead and lay out the diagram a little bit nicer. Let me make this code somewhat bigger. There we go. So if you take a look at this, you can see now that uh, Hobbit Ops is essentially the, here, let's, let's get rid of some of the excess detail on this, on these uh, views. Let's see. Come on. There we go. Don't have to show some of this stuff. It just clutters up the diagram. And uh, let's also tell you what, let's also get rid of the attributes. That'll make it a little bit shorter. So what you can see here is that we've got the, um, this actually illustrates the patterns that we're using here. So we've got Hobbit Ops, and Hobbit Ops is basically the interface or abstraction class from the bridge pattern. And this whole little hierarchy here plays the role of the presenter in the model view presenter pattern. So Hobbit Ops basically is the abstraction class in the bridge pattern. As you'll see when we look at the code, all of its methods simply forward to the Hobbit Ops impl class, which is basically the imp implementer class or implementer role in the bridge pattern. And then we've got a couple of concrete implementers, Hobbit Ops content resolver, Hobbit Ops content provider client. And these provide different ways of accessing the content provider. We talked about this in the last uh, presentation on Friday, so I'm not going to go through this in great detail. Um, but basically, this is these are the, the patterns that we're using here. Let's go ahead and make these guys much more concise so we don't have to look at all the details. We'll zap this guy. We don't really need him right now. Let's lay out that diagram again so it's more concise. Now let's go over and let's take a look at the the model part of this. So we have something called the Hobbit provider, and we have the Hobbit provider impl, and then we have the SQL light and hash map. So let's grab those guys, and we will see if we can make them more concise so they don't take up quite so much space. Let's get rid of all the attributes for them. And we'll zap this thing. We don't really need to show that. And let's see if we can lay the diagram out again. There we go. Very nice. So this is the model hierarchy. And we have a Hobbit provider, which is really going to be implementing or extending, rather, the content provider class from Android. 
So that's going to define all the methods we've talked about before for content providers. Then we have Hobbit provider impulse. And uh, as you'll see here, we use, once again, we use the bridge pattern. And this is the interface that's the hob the content provider, but its implementation then goes ahead and factors out a bunch of common code that are shared by two different ways to represent the content provider state. One approach uses a hash map. We looked at that last time. The other approach uses SQL Lite, and we'll look at that this time. And what's cool about this, what's really, really cool about this design is it allows us to be able to make the abstraction be a lot less leaky because as you'll see, all the code over here in the uh, view and the presenter doesn't know, doesn't care how these things are implemented, either as SQLite or as a hash map. That's completely hidden from them. And by doing the design in this way, we can switch back and forth. And we've also ensured that our design works nicely for both SQL and other forms of storage, and it doesn't expose the mechanisms of the storage up to the users of those mechanisms. So all the code over here remains blissfully unaware of these details, and we push all those details down into the implementation. And you'll see some other really cool things that we'll talk about as we get a little bit further along as well. I guess the other thing I should point out here real briefly is that the ops guy over here, um, the, or rather the generic activity actually uses the um, retain fragment manager in order to store the ops presenter object. So that kind of comes along for free in this whole design. Okay, so that's just an overview of the design. And it's kind of cool because it lets us talk about the uh, design of this application without getting all wrapped around the axle in terms of how it's actually implemented. So it gives us a nice view. And you can see how easy it is to use object aid to, to visualize what we're doing. Let me go ahead and take a few, a few uh, questions. How would you use try with resources with older versions of Android? Uh, I'm not sure if you can use try with resources with older versions of Android. It seems to work OK. It certainly works OK with version 19 and beyond. Um, if you're using older versions than that, it looked like it worked OK on version 18. I suspect at some point um, it really has to do with uh, pushing the envelope as far as whether the older versions of Android work properly with Java 7 or not. And you'll just have to do some experimentation. I bet if you look up on, on Stack Overflow, you'll find out more information on that. Obviously, if you're really committed to, store, to using old versions of Android, you'll have to uh, not use that, that use older versions of Java compiler you'll have to not use the try with resources uh, block. I absolutely refuse to write code for this class that does not use the Java 7 features. It's just too hideous to try to write that code manually uh, because the auto close mechanisms with try with resources are really helpful. But uh, you, know, you may have to make compromises if you're stuck doing older portable code. Um, let's see, question about logcat. So, uh, are there better tools to see the contents of the database? There are undoubtedly better tools to see the contents of a database. I suggest you do a little bit of uh, Googling and stack overflowing to see what tools you could use with SQLite to visualize the contents. Um, let's see, about the Hobbit schema, if the table size is not, if the table size, I assume, if the, you mean the complexity of the table is not trivial, it would be nice to have common indexes for common queries. Uh, absolutely, yes, this is a very simple example. There are much more sophisticated ways of doing this. We uh, use some of those in the acronym uh, example or ac acronym assignment, as well as in the weather service provider assignment. My typical rule of thumb is if, if I end up using something more than one time, then I have a tendency to move that up into the, the contracts class. If I just use it one time, I'll probably put it where it's used because otherwise it's too far away from where it's used. But if they're sharing, then yes, absolutely. It's a good idea to make those um, common uh, indices for common queries. Good, good point. OK, uh, so those are some good questions. Let's now go ahead and take a look at the actual implementation of all this stuff, which is really fun. Let me bring this up. Share my Emacs window. And away we go. So uh, a lot of the 
application really hasn't changed very much. We still have the same manifest file. That's the same as before. Here's the source code. Uh, as you can see, we have an, a new set of activity uh, buttons that we've got here, which cleans things up a bit. So here's the new Hobbit activity. I won't spend a lot of time on this because we kind of talked about a lot of it last time. It has a list view to, to display the results. We keep track of a URI for various reasons that will become clear in a minute. We keep track of a cursor, simple cursor adapter for displaying the output. Here's our onCreate method. We set the content view, which has three buttons at the top of the screen. We get the view ID uh, for the, view, the list view. We go ahead and open up the generic activity framework, passing in our presenter uh, class, which is the Hobbit Ops class. And then we go ahead and we make ourselves a simple cursor adapter and make that be the adapter that works with the list view. This is just so that we can go ahead and display the results trivially. The on destroy method, when it's called, will close down Hobbit Ops when it's all done. Here's the add all method. This, of course, is what's connected to the add all button. When you click add all, this goes ahead and it inserts various characters from hobbits into the, to the database. So we can insert Bilbo and Gandalf and a bunch of dwarves and a dragon and Bjorn, the skin changer. We put the master of Lake Town in there. And we also insert the necromancer, who's basically a wizard. And when we're all done, we display the results. And we'll see how that all works. Uh, modify all does a bunch of operations that modify the database. So we update Bjorn's race by his name. He's now a bear. We update the necromancer to be Sauron by his URI. We delete a bunch of dwarves who are killed in battle. We delete uh, all the dragons and all the men who are left over. They're just one of each. And we display the results. And finally, we have the delete all method, which forwards to delete all. And then it goes ahead and says how many characters were deleted, if any. And it displays the results. And if we delete them all, they'll all be gone. Here's the display all method. It simply goes ahead and displays the results. And when display all gets called, it ultimately calls back to display cursor, which changes the cursor to the cursor that's passed in here. That's basically the activity. Keep in mind, this is the view and the model view presenter pattern. All right, let's go quickly look at the operations. This is these classes are playing the role of the presenter in the model view presenter pattern, and that's what the documentation says here. Uh, if you recall, this, this stuff hasn't changed a whole lot. We basically can access the database, or the content result, content provider by a content resolver or a content provider client. And uh, that's all so we can sort of optimize the access in cases where we're doing things in separate threads. If we want to make things faster, we can use the content provider client. Um, so we basically select the appropriate means of accessing the content provider. And this is just to help a little pattern. This is actually another pattern. This is it's called the, the external polymorphism pattern because content resolver and content provider client don't inherit from a common interface or base class. And therefore, we have to provide an extra class to give external polymorphism to use these things in a polymorphic way. The uh, All the methods here are, this is the bridge pattern, of course, so they just all go ahead and forward to the implementation methods. It's all real simple. This is just canonical bridge pattern stuff. Here's the actual implementation of all this. This does a few more interesting things. It keeps a weak reference to the Hobbit activity, which is the view, so we can talk back to it to get things displayed. It caches the cursor, so if we rotate the display, we can go ahead and redisplay anything that was stored in the cursor, which is a nice thing that falls out from using the retain fragment manager. On configuration just updates the activity. Uh, close is a no op by default. Make cursor adapter basically makes a cursor adapter that can be used to display the appropriate columns and the appropriate resource IDs via the view implemented by the activity. And so this is all hidden here so we don't leak the abstraction out to the user or to the, the activity part. Here's the insert mechanism. Now, this is pretty cool. This uses the template method pattern. So we basically go ahead and we insert the character's name and race into a content values object. 
And then we insert by calling the hook method. This is the template method. Insert is a template method. This code is common irrespective of whether the content resolver or content provider client is used to actually access the content provider. So this code is common here. And then we go ahead and we forward to an abstract method that then selects at runtime whether to use content provider or content resolver. And that's what actually goes ahead and inserts this thing into the content provider. Same thing works here. We do bulk insert, same basic idea. We iterate through the array of characters and add them to a content values array. And then we bulk insert that using the hook method, which is defined as an abstract method here. Query is an abstract method. Update by URI, same basic idea. Update by URI will go ahead and specifically update an, a single URI by its ID in the table. Update race by name will go ahead and find whoever has the name that's designated here. And then we will go ahead and update that content values object. So we'll update the columns in the row that matches the name that's associated here. So if there are multiple rows with the same name, then they're all going to be updated to have the same value, which is an important thing to talk about. We'll talk more about that later. So here we're providing the uh, name of the table, the thing we want updated, and then we're also providing a where clause and a set of arguments, one argument in fact to the where clause, that indicates where it's, uh, where it's going to find the appropriate row or rows to update. Here's the update uh, hook method. It's the abstract hook method. Delete works the same way. We can delete by name. We can delete by race. Those simply go ahead and, and pass in the appropriate um, where clauses here, column name or column race, into the delete hook method. And uh, here's the delete hook method. And the delete hook method will do the actual work. And then here's delete all, which deletes everything. If you pass in nulls to delete, it will delete everything in the table. Here's display all. Uh, this is just showing off how to use the projection and selection and select args features of query. Uh, we don't have to do that. We could pass in nulls. We get the same behavior in this particular case. So what we're going to do here is we're going to query the um, content URI. We're going to go ahead and query the table. This is the these are the columns to display. We'll look at them in a second. They're basically the projection. And then we're going to indicate which uh, rows we want. And the rows are basically anything where the column race column, the value of the column race column, <laughs> is either dwarf, Maya, hobbit, dragon, man, or bear, which are all the characters that we've got. Um, like I said, if we just pass nulls in, it'll go ahead and query the whole thing. We'll get the same result. If we actually got anything back, then we go ahead and display it. If we didn't get anything back, then we go ahead and pop up a toast saying there's no items to display, and we set the cursor to be null so that it doesn't display the old results now that we've gone ahead and found that there's nothing in there. OK, so that's Hobbit Ops Impl. I'm not going to spend much time on the resolver, content resolver and content provider client implementations. They're really simple. All they do is they simply define the appropriate access means, content provider client in this case, or content resolver in this case. They initialize things properly in their virtual constructor. And then all of their methods simply go ahead and call the appropriate method via the appropriate access means. So insert calls content resolver insert if you're using the content resolver. Over here, insert calls the content provider client insert method, and so on and so forth. So you can see this; these classes are really, really, really simple. And that's the external polymorphism part of this thing. We're making this whole abstraction polymorphic, even though content provider client and content resolver in Android do not inherit or from a single interface or implement a single interface. OK, so that's basically just sort of the presenter view of everything. You can see it really does the heavy lifting as far as the computation goes. And it connects the values in the database with the, the view. So that's its role. The final piece of the puzzle, which is really the most important one here uh, from the point of view of this class, is the content provider abstraction. This provides the model portion of the model view presenter pattern. 
let's go ahead and take a look at this. What's really cool about this particular implementation, of course, is that we've abstracted away from how the data is actually stored. And we do that through a couple of different techniques. One technique is we define a contract file and you'll see how the contract file works here. This defines all the sort of um, database storage independent ways of representing the data in the model in a structured way. So we define the content ten authority, which is just a unique name across the system. We define a base content URI, which is the content authority uh, appended after the content scheme, which is content colon slash slash. We define the thing called a path character, which is, is in this case the, ta the table name. And then we define the character entry, which is a base columns uh, implementation. This defines the actual content URI. This is how we get to the table. So we go ahead and we take the base URI and we add the table to it and we build it to make it a, a, a URI that's going to be able to point to the appropriate table. We then define a couple of MIME types which are used to decide whether we have one or many of something. We define our columns to display. This, in this case, we have the ID column, the column name, and the column race. And then we also have their resource IDs, which are defined here. They're all ultimately going to be uh, strings. The table name is just whatever we want to call it. We call it a character table for Hobbit characters. We define the, the columns themselves, name and race. And then we have another helper method that builds a URI. Given an ID, it'll uh, basically append that ID at the end of the content URI. So that's a way to identify a specific row in the table. All right, so that's the, con the character contract. Note to how that nothing in this file really indicates how the storage is, is done. Here's the character record. This is used really only for the hash map implementation. We could probably move this as a nested class. It just stores the various uh, fields for each record that's going to be stored in the hash map. Here's the Hobbit database helper. As usual, this inherits from SQL Open Helper. Here's where we define the database name. That's what's actually going to be stored as a file on your device. Here's the database version, version one. Here's the table that here's the string that creates the SQL table. So we create a table that has this name with an ID, a name, and a race as uh, fields. The ID, of course, is the primary key. It's an integer, and the name and the race are, are non null fields. Here's the Hobbit database helper constructor, which calls up to the superclass and explains where you want the information to reside. Here's the onCreate method that's called automatically when the database is created. And that goes ahead and creates the table using the schema definition we defined here. And here's on upgrade, which drops the table and then creates a new table. That's just a convenience class. This is canonical. You always find things used this way when you program with, with SQL in uh, Android and, and you program with SQL with content providers. Here you find the Hobbit provider. Now we're finally getting into the meat of the, the, the content provider implementation. Um, Hobbit provider imp extends content provider. So this is what actually gets exposed via the manifest file. It's the Hobbit provider that's exposed out as the content provider implementation. However, its implementation is very clever. Uh, and it uses the bridge pattern in order to be able to select between either a hash map based implementation or an SQL light based implementation. And you'll see how that works here in a second. By default, we're going to use SQL light, but you could change that if you so desired uh, easily. Um, here's the actual implementation. So this is the implementation of the Hobbit provider, which is either Hobbit provider hash map or Hobbit provider SQLite. This is just good old bridge pattern stuff. And because this is the bridge pattern, all the methods that are defined in this abstraction class do nothing other than forward to the implementation type. 
So you can see get type forwards, insert forwards, bulk insert forwards, query forwards, update forwards, and delete forwards. Um, if you don't understand the bridge pattern, just go take a look. Just Google bridge pattern. It's explained. It's a very, very simple pattern. It's used to separate interface from implementation. Here's the on create method. This selects the appropriate concrete implementation based on the content provider type. And uh, you're either going to be a hash map implementation or an SQLite implementation. In the not distant future, I'm going to define a way to select these implementations based on menu options that you can choose when you run your program. So it'll be dynamically decided when the program starts to run, which is kind of cool. All right, let's take a look at Hobbit Provider Impl. This is really the workhorse of this whole thing. Um, and all the common code that's shared by the hash map implementation and the SQLite implementation goes in here. Once again, this is not, this is agnostic with respect to how things are implemented. So we keep a context for various content resolver activities. We keep track of whether or not the URI we've got wants to work on one character or a set of characters. Um, you'll also notice that this particular file does all the boilerplate implementation that you come to expect when you see a content provider, and I'll talk more about that in a second. For example, it has a URI matcher. And uh, let's see, let's go ahead and put the URI matcher right here so we can see it. Let's see, I don't really need to make that synchronized. Um, so the URI matcher, as you probably remember, is how we go ahead and decide at runtime whether a URI is going to identify a group of characters in a table or just a single character with a specific ID in the table. And this is something that's always done in Android content providers. Um, here's the constructor. It sets the context. Here's the get type method. We don't really use this much, but it's used, once again, if you want to figure out whether something is done in a, uh, a single way or multiple way. This is a more common way to do it, like that. Now let's get to the fun part. So this is the insert method. And the particular way I'm doing this, you'll see it's all done exactly the same way for all the methods that are defined in the, Hunted, the Hobbit provider impl. So we come in here and we figure out what kind of request is being made. Are we trying to access the entire table or just an individual element? So for insert, you always have to insert things into the table, not into one element. If you want to update one element or one row, you need to use update, not insert. So we do the URI match. If we get a, anything other than characters, we throw an exception. If we get the characters tag, then we're going to insert characters. And you'll see what insert characters are. Insert characters is an abstract hook method, which is actually going to do the SQL or hash map version of getting this stuff stored in the data structure. Now. Once we've inserted something, then we go ahead and we notify anybody who's registered that a row was inserted. So notice how we say um, M context, get content resolver, notify change. And so what we're doing here by using the, the bridge pattern and the template method pattern, we are factoring out the common code for all the different operations. This is all common code. And then we're having the specific code for whether it's stored in an SQLite database or a hash map, that's being handled through a hook method. So the template method is doing all the common stuff, including notifying anybody that things have changed. And the specific details of how the storage is taking place is done through a concrete hook method. And so that's really cool, because that way we don't have to write this code more than one time. Here's the insert characters method. We'll come back and see that when we look at the specific implementations. Here's bulk insert. So bulk insert, uh, once again, works exactly the same way. We figure out whether we're inserting, trying to insert the, in the entire table or one element. If we're trying to insert to one element, we throw an exception. If we're trying to insert in the whole table, we call the hook method for bulk insert characters, which will go ahead and insert them. And then we go ahead and notify if uh, anything worked. I guess we should say if return count greater than zero, we'll notify anybody that rows were inserted. And we'll take a look at those implementations shortly. Um, here's bulk insert characters. That's the, the abstract hook method, which gets implemented by the subclass. Here's query. Query finally has 
actually something interesting happening here. So you'll see when we look at our URI matcher, we're either trying to query the, the entire table or one element in the table. If we're trying to query the entire table, we call query characters. If we're trying to query one character, we call query character with no S. So this is nice because it's really separating concerns very, very cleanly. You'll notice even if you query the entire table, you can also limit what you're querying based on selections and selection args and so on and so forth. Um, once we're done, we then set the notification URI, which is used by things like the content, lo the cursor loader, in order to know to re-update the results after the query has finished. Query characters and query character are abstract hook methods that get filled in by subclasses. Here's the update method, same basic idea. We can either update the entire table or we can update one row in the table. Once again, very clean separation of concerns. It's really easy. Once you understand the pattern that's going on here, it all looks exactly the same. We notify anybody if things have been inserted. Um, I guess what we should do again is say if Rex updated greater than zero, then we'll notify. No sense notifying if nothing happened. Okay. Um, update characters and update character are abstract hook methods. Here's delete, same basic idea. Again, we're going to go ahead and decide if it's the whole table or just one element do the appropriate hook method call, and then if everything, uh, if something actually got deleted, we'll go ahead and update and uh, indicate that rows or rows, a row or rows were deleted. And here's delete character. So that's basically how we abstract away from whether there's one or many. That's how we abstract away from whether we use a hash map or an SQL light. And that's also how we keep our abstraction from leaking. We don't want to really push up to the application the details of whether you're using SQL Lite or some other means for implementing this. Now that we've talked about this, let's go ahead and talk about SQL Lite implementation because that's really most relevant for the assignment. So Hobbit Provider SQL Lite extends Hobbit Provider Impl. So what that means is it's just going to fill in the hook methods that are needed by the Impl in order for its template methods to do the job correctly. Here's the Hobbit database helper object. We go ahead and uh, call up to the super class when this thing gets uh, created. Here's when the onCreate method gets called. We make ourselves the Hobbit database helper using the context that was passed in. Here's insert characters. At long last, we actually get to do some, some SQL uh, operations. So as you can see here, the uh, insert characters method, but it's called back. This is going to get the database in writable mode. And then we'll go ahead and insert into the table the content values that were passed in. So this would be, for example, this would be Bilbo as the name and Hobbit as the race. So we insert that into the table. If that succeeds, we go ahead and return the URI for the row that we just inserted into the table. If not, we throw an exception. Note, by the way, that this call here is guaranteed by SQLite to be atomic. So it's thread safe. Uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, about that. However, bulk insert is different. With bulk insert, we're actually going to walk through an array of content values one at a time, and we're going to insert them into the table. Uh, now, Insert is atomic for one operation, but not for a group of them. So if you want to atomically insert a bunch of items, you need to use begin transaction when things start and end transaction when you're done. And if everything goes according to plan, then you go ahead and set the transaction to be successful. So you basically say, go ahead and commit the transaction. So this is just illustrating how you can use transactional logic here in order to be able to uh, handle atomic updates, or sorry, atomic inserts into the table. Here's query characters. Now, in order to be, this, this shows a, a little clever thing that I wrote. In order to be able to abstract away from whether SQL Lite or uh, the hash map is used as the actual implementation of the storage data structure, we didn't make the selection string 
include the funky little wildcard characters because that would sort of make it more complicated for the hash map, unnecessarily complicated. So instead, we just provide the, the column name as the selection, and then we give a bunch of selection args, which are the values of that column. So for example, uh, the, the column might be race, and the names could be hobbit, dwarf, man, dragon, etc. So what we do here is we have a little helper method called add selection args that if you've got a, uh, a group of selection args, we'll go ahead and build up a selection that basically combines all those selection args together with wildcard statements. So what we do is we walk through the selection args and for the, all the selection arcs, we go ahead and we expand it. So it would basically end up creating a selection that said like race equal question mark and race equal question or or race equal question mark or race equal question mark or race equal question mark. And then you could provide selection arcs that would be um, dwarf, hobbit, Maya, uh, bear, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just our way of abstracting from the, the details a bit. So, and we can either do ors or ands. For most of what we're doing here, we're doing ors. So we go ahead and make a selection. Uh, we, we expand the selection if necessary. And then we go ahead and we do a query on a readable instance of the database for this table with the list of columns we care about, which could be null, in which case we care about all columns. And then we give in the where clause and the selection args, which are the values to fill in the wildcards in the selection clause, which also could be null. Um, but don't have to be. And then whatever comes back is basically the cursor that corresponds to that query. So you can query the entire database, or you can actually come down here and query an individual row. So if you want to query an individual row, then of course you have to take the URI that was passed in and extract the row ID from this uh, arg, and then you're going to query for just that particular row. That'll go ahead and, and query for just that row. Um, and I guess I should probably also go ahead and uh, fix this up a little bit so it handles the selection args. I, I need to add that feature. I didn't use that feature, so I haven't added it yet. Here are the update methods. So update characters. We'll go ahead and do the same trick with expanding the selection args. And then it'll, it'll go ahead. Let me go ahead and grab this guy. We use it here. Um, so this will then go ahead and update all the entries in the table name with the content values if the selection and selection args match. If these are null, then of course the entire table is updated, which is typically not what you want. Um, but if you give the appropriate selection and selection args, it'll update just the ones that you want updated. So if you recall, what we did was we updated, uh, for example, Bjorn's race was updated from man to bear because he's a skin changer. You could also update character by the URI, in which case we go ahead and create ourselves a specific selection criteria that adds an ID check. And so if you take a look down here, you'll see that add key ID check to where statement will come in here and basically add the character entry to the where statement um, in the case where we want to limit the search for updating or deleting or whatever to just a single row in the table. Here's delete characters. We can delete everything, or we can do the same trick. We can delete one character by adding the ID check to the where statement in order to make sure that that's uh, limited to just one row. Okay, so that's basically the SQL Lite implementation. Uh, there's also a hash map implementation. I'm not going to walk through this in detail. We walked through it last time. Basically, this just shows, just, just for fun, how you could implement a content provider using a hash map instead of implementing a content provider using SQL Lite. And I did this for a couple reasons. I wanted to kind of see sort of what's going on under the hood. So I wrote my own little, um, little quasi database like mechanism. It's very simple, of course, not as nearly as powerful as SQL Lite and not persistent either. But I also wanted to make sure that my abstractions weren't leaky. So I wanted to make sure that the same code would work identically whether I used um, a hash map provider or an SQL Lite provider implementation. Naturally, of course, the SQL Lite implementation will retain the values across runs of the program, 
whereas the hash map version will not. That's where they differ naturally because SQLite is persistent by default. Um, I suppose if I was really trying to hurt myself, I could have replaced the use of a hash map with a shared preferences object, which probably would have let me do more or less the same thing because shared preferences can also be stored persistently. Okay, so that is, believe it or not, the implementation of all this stuff. Um, a bunch of things to sort of reflect upon before we take some, some questions about this. The, the actual use of SQLite, while important to understand and embrace, is really not ultimately that crucial to most of your application if you've designed it properly. So if, you, if you've done a good job of designing your application properly, then you really shouldn't know, you really shouldn't care about a lot of the implementation details of what SQLite is doing. And so part of the motivation for designing my application in the way I did was to enforce that. So uh, by using, uh, using SQLite-based content providers or using the HashMap content provider, I, I was more careful in, in trying to keep the abstraction from being leaky, which is not a good thing. Uh, you'll also note that the use of the, the model view presenter pattern, as usual, greatly simplifies the bulk of the application structure once you understand the pattern. If you don't understand the pattern, then you're drowning in a sea of classes. But once you understand the pattern, the design makes perfect sense. And more importantly, all the other designs you're likely to do will also make a lot of sense as well, uh, because they're all more or less using the same pattern. We used a bunch of other patterns throughout the implementation as well. We used the bridge pattern to separate interface from implementation. We use the template method pattern to be able to factor out common code that could be shared by different implementations, thereby maximizing reuse. And you see how that got used in both the presenter classes and in the model classes very nicely. We use the external polymorphism pattern to deal with the fact that content resolvers and content provider clients are not related by any common interface or base class. Um, and, and everything kind of goes where it belongs. So that's that's kind of the nice way of doing this. It's a bit overkill maybe for something as simple as the, con the Hobbit content provider, but I wanted to show something that was a pretty industrial strength design architecture, even though the example was fairly simple, because if we had a complicated example, you get lost in the example and wouldn't really be able to see the design. Okay, let's go ahead and take the the uh, some questions. Unlike the Hobbit example in assignment one, acronym provider update does not contain an implementation case for acronym. Um, is there a reason for this? I just don't, I don't think that we needed to, we, we didn't have the use case in our program for updating an individual acronym in the database. Um, in fact, I might have to go back and look carefully to see if we even used the update mechanism at all. We may not have used the update mechanism at all. Uh, obviously, it's easy enough to add that. If somebody wants to send me a, a push request, we can add it. Um, let's see. Uh, ah, good question. After a change in the database, we call notify change. Can you give an example of how to implement a listener on values that have changed in the database? So this particular uh, program at this point just illustrates how you notify on a change. Basically, whenever the uh, insert or the delete or the uh, update template methods are done and things have changed, then we go ahead and we update the results by notifying that change. We, I have not actually shown how that gets used, but I'll, I'll probably add that when we get to that part of the uh, course. That'll, that'll probably take place next week. We're going to talk about things like content providers, uh, sorry, we're going to talk about uh, uh, cursor loaders and uh, async query handlers and so on. And, and typically, you would have a content provider that would be uh, updating or notifying when things change, and then there would be activities that would respond to those updates, and they would go ahead and, and redo their views accordingly. Okay, in the existing code base, when we add a second implementation path, not sharing a super class, um, let's see, All right, I'm trying to parse the question. When we add a second implementation path, not sharing a superclass, the correct OO technique is to refactor to external polymorphism. 
So external polymorphism is used a lot as code ages. Um, yes and no. So uh, external polymorphism is is a very uh, kind of an unusual pattern in the sense that it's it's really important for refactoring and. So I think, uh, as Lester points out, as, as the code ages and you need to extend it to do new things that you didn't anticipate originally, and you don't have access to the source code, like we don't have access to the source code for content provider and content resolver, or with content provider, client, content resolver. So, so therefore, we can't do the right thing. The right thing would be to go back and refactor Android to have content, content resolver and content provider, client, inherit or implement a common interface or, or abstract class. That's probably the right thing to do, arguably. Maybe not, but it seems like it would make sense. They didn't do that, right? So we have two choices. We can either forever keep those separate code paths in our program, which is very tedious and, and redundant, or we can apply external polymorphism and then provide a new abstraction that embraces both or, or more, if there's more than, than two, both ways of handling things in a common model. Um, so if you work in a design environment that rewards and encourages refactoring, and you don't have the luxury of going back and modifying existing code to add in commonality into the original hierarchy itself, then external polymorphism is very useful. But you can see there's a number of conditions under which it's applicable. You've you've not you've got to not be able to modify existing classes. You've got to be in an environment that encourages refactoring, right? Um, if you have both of those things don't apply, then there may be other alternatives that may be more appropriate. Okay, so that is the coverage that I wanted to do for the Hobbit content provider. Let me now go ahead and show you one more thing to quote the immortal Steve Jobs. Let's go up here. And in fact, let's do this. Let's not share, let's not share Emacs. Let us instead share the IDE. There we go. For those of you who, uh, who like to argue about who has the better IDE. Um, all I can say is that object aid works nicely with Eclipse, and as far as I can tell, doesn't work at all with uh, Android Studio yet. I wish they would add that support, because I'd like to be able to move to Android Studio as much as the next person. But right now, unfortunately, it's not really usable for these kinds of things. So this is the weather service uh, provider application. And we're going to cover this in more detail next time. We'll go through the code. But I just wanted to give you a quick overview of how it works and what it does, because it's very related to the, the current programming assignment, programming assignment number one. So let's go take a look. So you can see I created an object aid window. And now I can just go ahead and drag in various classes. So you can see, for example, that um, weather activity is a generic activity just like they always are so that's obviously playing the role of the view in the model view presenter pattern and you can see it's got a whole bunch of fields which are going to be used to display the results of getting the weather from the web service and then we've got a couple of methods like get weather which is really the workhorse and a couple other things that are going to be used to display the results and so on and so forth so that's basically the the model portion of everything and let's go ahead and make that nice and tidy so it doesn't take up very much space. Once again, object data is really cool. I think we can tell it to lay out the diagram automatically. There we go. Um, here is the, whoops, here's the presenter portion of this. This is weather ops. Uh, you can see over here that weather ops implements the um, generic async task ops interface and contains an instance of a generic async task. And so that's very, very similar to what you're doing with your acronym uh, provider, acronym service provider application. And you can see that weather ops, of course, weather ops is what's held by the uh, generic activity in the, the view role. 
so weather ops is, is weather ops these classes are part of the weather ops uh, presenter role and the key method here is get current weather which goes ahead and executes a generic async task which calls do in background to run and on post execute to run so that's where we're going to do the the actual presenter logic so let's go ahead and shrink that down a little bit uh, and relay it out and then over here in the provider side of the world now we're into the the model role so we've got the weather provider this this doesn't do the the super duper um, bridge-based approach I just talked about with the Hobbit content provider because I, I don't want to go to that much trouble to write a hash map implementation of this. This uses just a good old SQL Lite implementation. And of course, the SQL Lite implementation is defined in the weather contract. We have a database helper, just like we have in the acronym application. Those things are very canonicalized. Weather provider, as you can imagine, inherits from content provider, and it defines various methods that we've come to know and love, like insert, delete, update, and bulk insert. And those are actually some things you're going to have to implement, but that's basically the design. Let's go ahead and make this guy small. So he, of course, plays the role of, the weather provider plays the role of the model. And then we have the cache. And uh, the real key thing here is the weather timeout cache. And you can see that that's actually used by weather ops. And weather timeout cache implements timeout cache. So it implements the methods that are defined here. We, we did this originally because we had some um, cool examples from a previous MOOC that, that wanted to have a common way of doing a timeout cache. And so we have one that is implemented with the executor completion service that I just fixed up the other day to make it robust with singletons. And then we also have one that's used with basically a uh, content provider, and that's this one. And so this implements all the methods for inserting and removing elements from the cache. And let's go ahead and shrink that guy down a little bit. So he's there. And let's see if we can lay this out a little better. There we go. That's kind of cool. Lay it out so there's fewer line crossings in the whole thing. Now we can kind of see the whole view. And then, of course, we also have a cleanup cache receiver. This for kicks. Let's bring that in there. So this is actually going to be used by the timeout cache in order to be able to clean things up. Don't really need to show that right now. Um, and then, of course, there's also weather data. And you can see that the weather data is actually pretty complicated. Weather data is used by weather ops. And this is actually used by Retrofit to store all the po It's the POJO representation of the JSON. And that, of course, comes from the weather service proxy, which is also used by weather ops. So this is just a, a quick kind of high-level overview of the uh, implementation that we've got for the weather service. What I'll do next time is I'll actually walk through the implementation and I'll show you some of the techniques that are used there. I just wanted to give you sort of a, a design-centric view of what it's doing and also kind of show off how easy it is to use object aid to get a bird's eye view of the structure of your application, which as you can imagine is, is invaluable, especially if you didn't write the code originally and you're having a hard time understanding how all the various pieces fit together. So armed with knowledge of object aid, you ought to be able to take the code, even if you're using Android Studio, just install Eclipse and use object aid to visualize the code. You should be able to visualize your acronym provider implementation to see what all the different things are doing. Uh, and then not armed with your knowledge of the model view presenter pattern, you'll then understand why things end up going where they go, because they're splitting out according to the parts of the pattern. And then all you have to do, once you get that big picture view, is look at the to-do items to fill in, and then add those implementations into your, your design. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to kind of give you a, a quick bird's eye view of how that type of, of uh, tool could be used very quickly. It, you notice I did the whole thing interactively. It took me no time at all to do this. And you can do exactly the same kind of thing with your implementation as well. Okay, well, we've just about reached the end of today's discussion. I will, uh, if there's any questions, of course, I'll be happy to take them as we wrap up.
If there are no questions, then uh, I will look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. What we'll do on Wednesday is we'll get together again and I will walk through the weather service provider implementation. And that'll give you a really good idea, I think, of what you need to do to make your acronym service provider code work properly, which is not identical, of course, but it has a lot of the same architectural and implementation elements as weather service provider. And that's perfectly okay, right? Because that's the point we're trying to make here with our pattern-oriented approach. We're trying to show that there's a lot of commonality in the solution. And if you design your, your programs properly, they should all sort of look, they should all start looking and feeling the same over time because you're following common patterns. And model view presenter is really at the heart of the architecture we've been using uh, and the pattern language we've been using throughout all the different moves. Okay, well, thank you all very much for coming. And I will get the videos up just as soon as I can. Have a good day.